scope of the project is similar. So the, the upgrade to Challenger 3 is to build a new turret with a new gun and to integrate it into quite an old set of hulls, uh, namely the Challenger 2 hulls. And for that reason, um, I think it's, it's understandable why people have concerns that the program might go along similar lines. It's an older platform warrior than, than Challenger 2 by a good 20 years. There are some elements to the design of the hulls on Warrior that meant that there was a shorter life expectancy to those hulls. And that's not the case with Challenger 3. If you take a really old hull that was manufactured at a time when turrets were serialized to the hull, so each turret was fitted to a specific vehicle, then you get a unique pattern of wear on the hull. And so when new turrets were manufactured, they couldn't just be dropped into each vehicle, they had to be fitted individually. And there were all sorts of kinks that came about because of the very old base platforms that they were using. The first problem that I think they're really going to have to overcome is how do you take uh, old vehicles that have each had a difficult life and have worn in unique ways and then fit uh, mass manufactured new components into those hulls so that they move and interact in a predictable way that something like the biocontrol computer can calculate for. The second challenge, I think, is that if they are not able to secure exports and that requires them to be able to demonstrate to countries uh, that there is growth potential in this platform, not just a one-off upgrade per package. Um, if they're unable to get those exports, then the budget for the program may well climb. And so they will need to work out some mitigations to avoid that risk. There are not a large number of users in the first place. There's only Oman. Um, and secondly, you know, no one will really want to buy it until they've seen the capability has been proven, which means that it will need to be probably in British Army service or at least pass the demonstration phase before they can secure exports. And at that point, many of the countries that are potential customers will likely have already procured solutions from elsewhere, with which Challenger might be competitive but won't be a game-changing leap ahead of. The third challenge that I think is going to be uh, really difficult to overcome is that the lack of an autoloader means that you still need a, a crew member who is loading the gun um, and with them fixed in that task you have fairly limited crew capacity to do some of the things that the army would like the crew to be doing like controlling unmanned aerial systems from the hull. I think there is also a challenge in terms of weight. Competitive armoured vehicles are actually going down, well, they're going up and down in weight at each end of the spectrum. So they're going towards um, 50 tonnes, kind of being the, the uh, higher end in terms of design principles. The level of protection that they want to have on Challenger 3 risks it climbing towards 80 tonnes. And at that point, the logistics of employing it get very, very difficult. If Challenger 2 went to war today, its rounds would not be knocking out its targets. The British Army has a crippling deficiency in firepower across the force. Um, and one of the few platforms which has significant firepower as its main battle tank fleet. If the force had very large numbers of anti-tank guided weapons and a high volume of medium caliber guns across the rest of the force, uh, along with supporting artillery, then you can envisage it potentially taking risk on its main battle tanks. As it stands, we have too few guns uh, at almost every caliber and we do not have a large stockpile of anti-tank guided weapons and so uh, all of a sudden Challenger 3 is one of the few parts of the army that will reliably kill things it comes up against apart from uh, higher end modernized main battle tanks. Um, so I think it would be a great surprise if the force were to abandon them at this point.